it's a pleasure to be here. I'll see if I can share my screen and find my file that I was. I hope you can, that's going to come up soon. It will, it will. Sometimes Teams is a little bit tricky, <laughs> as we all know. Huh. Can you see that okay? Is that yes, yes, we can, we can. Thank <clears throat> you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. And the, the picture behind my head is actually Funafuti, the capital of Tuvalu. So I want, to, I want to look at this issue of the connection between climate change, human rights and, and, and peace issues. And the, the critical issue is that we are facing, you know, a, a climate change crisis. Uh, NASA has recently, you know, said that last year was the warmest year on record and the World Meteorological Organization has said that the last eight years have been the warmest on record as well and that sea level rise and ocean warming has hit new highs. So th there are serious issues around us. And this is clearly a, a global crisis that we're facing now. For, for many millions of people, climate change constitutes a serious threat to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy the right to life. And human-induced climate change is the largest, most pervasive threat to human society the world has ever experienced. And, and I, I'm not overstating that. I think it's, it's a, a clearly a global concern. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its last report uh, said that approximately 3.6 billion people, more than half the world's population, live in areas characterised as being highly vulnerable to climate change hazards. So that, that's, you know, a large number of people are you know, in, in a very serious situation. And this is the, particularly the case for children. Uh, UNICEF have reported that one billion children are at extremely high risk of climate change impacts. And, and, and <clears throat> children and young people are, you know, some of the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And this is causing significant loss and damage um, and it's one of the greatest sort of intergenerational injustices that children and young people face today, especially girls in low income countries. So where the legacy we're creating today is a serious problem for, for younger generations. And one of the major issues that I'm particularly interested in, and I reported to the Human Rights Council in June of last year around this issue is, is climate change displacement. In 2021, uh, 22.3 million people were displaced from their homes due to weather-related events. Most of these people were uh, displaced within their own country, but certainly there are people who are disgraced, displaced across international borders as well. And th there are all sorts of human rights implications for climate change. Uh, you know, uh, this includes, you know, the, the, you know, denying people their right to life, to health, to food, to development, self-determination, water and sanitation, and many other basic human rights are being uh, affected by climate change. And one, one of the, the crucial issues, and it's one that I've been following, is that the issue of a proportion of people displaced by climate change are forced to cross international borders. And these people are not defined as refugees under the Refugee Convention because they haven't suffered some form of political persecution, which is the sort of definition of, of Refugee Convention. Subsequently, these people fall through the cracks as far as legal protection is concerned. And, and they also face all sorts of uh, human rights abuses and violations as a, a consequence of that. And, and this is just one example. This is a so-called refugee camp in Kenya, just across the border from Somalia. And, uh, you know, Somalia has been suffering a prolonged drought for a number of years, and, and people are being displaced across the border into Kenya as a consequence of this, uh, this prolonged drought. And, of course, it, it has you know, implications not only for the country where the climate change impacts are occurring, 
but also the receiving country as well. They have to bear the burden of, of you know, uh, putting up, uh, you know, accommodation, providing services for those people. Uh, you know, the UN High Commission for Re Refugees is working with them on this issue, but it is a burden for, for receiving country. And invariably, that's developing countries who face that. If we if we look at this sort of issue, you know, this whole displacement issue is causing unrest. And there is a theory that the original, you know, war in Syria came as a consequence of a nine year drought. And there was a large migration of people from rural areas into the cities. And uh, that caused, uh, uh, you know, domestic turmoil in that country, which was, you know, suggested as one of the drivers for for the war in Syria. And, and one of the issues, and this is in, in Libya, a picture taken in Libya, is that there are a lot of people moving away from climate change impacts throughout Africa, as far as away as the Gambia. And there've been you know, studies of people ending up in Libya and, and what's you know, uh, research to find out what the cause of their displacement was. And some people as far away as the Gambia have moved through to Libya because of climate change impacts. And as a consequence of that, they're put into very vulnerable situations where they've been subjected to unlawful killings and forced disappearance, slavery, forced labor, arbitrary de uh, detention, torture, ill treatment, trafficking, sexual violence and extortion. So it's no wonder these people are, are trying to escape uh, from, from that area. And since 2014, over 26,000 people have died or gone missing crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Most of these deaths or disappearances over the 20,000 occurred in central Mediterranean and, and considered amongst the deadliest migration routes in the world. And Italy has been the major recipient of that, the 31,000 since arrivals in 2023 alone, um, uh, up from 7,900 in 2022. And the interesting thing is that my, most migrants come from Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Bangladesh, Tunisia, and Pakistan, and they have de departed from Libya or Tunisia. So it's interesting that it's not just people just from Africa who are de being displaced uh, and work their way through through uh, <coughs> through Libya, but there's people from South Asia as well. And you may recall there were very large floods in Pakistan in 2022. And I visited Bangladesh in 2022 uh, to look at the impacts of climate change and displacement in that country. And it, they estimate that around 300,000 people are internally displaced each year as a consequence of climate change events in Bangladesh. But it's not just African countries and South, uh, and South Asia, certainly, you know, Pacific Island countries are right on the edge of climate change impacts. And I've certainly witnessed that from, uh, you know, m my involvement with Tuvalu. Tuvalu's highest point above sea level is only four metres. On average, people live less than two metres. So they're, you know, they're facing the brunt of rising sea levels, but the most immediate packs, uh, impacts are storm surges. Uh, and you know, in 2016, uh, Cyclone Pam washed right across the island, three islands of Tuvalu, sending waves right across the island. Another interesting fact and, and not well known is that it's also affecting sea life, you know, the warming of the ocean. The ocean, uh, you know, absorbs a lot of the heat that's coming from, from the, 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 the sun. And uh, a lot of that is warming up and that's changing the migration patterns of, of fish and particularly tuna and tuna is a major source of income for Pacific Island countries and the tuna are moving away from the warmer oceans moving eastward and this is affecting uh, uh, you know productivity and of course it you know there are a lot of distant water nations operating uh, fishing in that region as well and so there are regional tensions over you know tuna stocks and this is a big issue. Uh, just in September last year, I visited Honduras uh, to look at the impacts of climate change there and particularly looking at the whole issue of uh, migration of people from Honduras uh, as a consequence of climate change. 
And so the people on the Pacific side of Honduras uh, have suffered a very long drought. And there are, you know, I spoke with people uh, there in rural communities who are just leaving the country because it, it's no longer viable for them. But on the, on the Caribbean coast, they've suffered very large uh, hurricanes and, and got smashed. And this is, uh, you know, 8,000 people were hit by Hurricane Mitch in 1998 were killed by Hurricane Mitch. And, and it, you know, when I went there, there's still recovery efforts after that hurricane. So these these are the, sort of, you know, global problems of, of climate change. And so what we're seeing, you know, a large number of migrants uh, coming to the US-Mexico border. Um, that, you know, and two million, in fact, were there in 2021. Now, there are a variety of reasons of why people are migrating to the U.S. border. You know, uh, social and economic issues in Venezuela are, are some of them, uh, other issues in Guatemala and so forth. But a certain percentage of those people are definitely, you know, displaced people as a consequence of climate change. And that's causing tensions and unrest in that region as well as a consequence of that migration patterns. So there's, you know, there have been studies to sort of link this issue between climate change and armed conflict. And out of the 20 countries considered the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, 13 are also affected by armed conflict. Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, Somalia, Yemen, are all in states of violent protracted conflict. Uh, and, you know, Climate change is one of the causes of that fact. Fact, and conflicts harm assets, uh, you know, and, and and make it difficult for countries to absorb uh, shocks uh, and institutions and markets and their livelihoods. And so, people's food security are affected by these th these issues. And the UN Security Council looked at this issue in 2011. And said, you know, saw that climate change recognised as a, a threat multiplier, uh, you know, <clears throat> and you know, looked particularly at the Sahel, Sahel region in West Africa around this issue. And the UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, you know, made this statement at the Security Council: "We must make no mistake. The facts are clear. Climate change is real." and is accelerating in a dangerous manner. It not only exacerbates threats to international peace and security, it is a threat to international peace and security. Uh, and so this, you know, this is the challenge, uh, you know, that's been considered by the Security Council. One, one of the most tragic things, and I, you know, that I was, you know, had to confront when I was special rapporteur was talking with people working with children who have been recruited as child soldiers. And the, the, there's a, a real tragedy there of um, 49 people were internally displaced and estimated 35 million people or 82% were children below the age of 18. And a lot of those people fall foul to uh, militia, uh, you know, and putting them at risk of being recruited by militia. And, you know, I heard testimonies of uh, of children being put in very awful situations where they're they're forced to kill people or be killed themselves, and the, these are real the tragedies that children. And UNICEF is doing work to try and you know rehabilitate some of these child soldiers to give them back their youth, uh, but it's a real challenge once you put in that awful situation. And. Uh, you know, there's been studies which suggest that climate change is raising incidents of maritime piracy. And this is, you know, an issue in Somalia uh, where the, the, you know, the droughts, loss of income of that are forcing people to seek other sources of income. And that's led to, to marine piracy, maritime piracy. So there, there are all sorts of issues uh, <clears throat> connected to climate change and insecurity. And we're seeing this in the Pacific, uh, you know, because of the increased competition for fish stocks, uh, the United States is, uh, you know, creating a, a more uh, presence within the Pacific region. 
uh, and using Coast Guard cutters. And this is obviously, you know, in c direct competition with China, you know, to get access to, you know, fisheries resources of the region. So this is creating a region of instability, uh, you know, particularly between the US and China as a consequence. So the, this is the challenge we have with, uh, you know, climate change being a driver of, of, of uh, security issues. And, and the problem being is that we're not adequately addressing climate change as a serious threat to, to humanity. Um, you know, and, and the, the International Energy Agency said in 2021, the world is, if the world is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a target set in the Paris Agreement, there should be no new investments in fossil fuels. And unfortunately, you know, that, that, that suggestion has been ignored. It was recently announced that ExxonMobil earned over $56 billion dollars in 2022, Exxon 6.3, uh, you know, in profit every single hour last year. And Chevron recorded $35 billion in profit in 2022. So these big fossil fuel companies are making large amounts of money at the expense of people. And Saudi Aramco, uh, you know, recorded a huge profit last year of uh, $161 billion. Uh, and so, you know, there's huge inequities there. And, you know, studies in the United States around uh, the politics are saying that oil companies are buying influence, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, beyond and influencing various committees, uh, you know, in the US uh, uh, Congress around energy and so forth and, and sort of locating people in strategic positions. The other major issue is around fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, you know, there's still large amounts of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, the US being the biggest, um, uh, and Japan and the UK being the largest, uh, you know, uh, subsidizers of fossil fuels. And you, you no doubt have heard about, you know, recent announcements by the UK government to uh, expand its exploration of the North Sea <coughs> and subsidizing a lot of that. I was involved, uh, you know, when I was special rapporteur and writing to the UK government about the, the harsh treatment being handed out to, to uh, uh, environmental defenders, uh, you know, where we had environmental defenders uh, put in jail for uh, sentences of uh, up to four years for just hanging a banner off a bridge. And so the, the, there's this sort of influence of the oil industry directing government policy and you know the, the the people at the end of this are, are the the environmental defenders, which is very sad. And I was in I was in the Philippines in November the, last year, uh, looking at the whole issue of climate change impacts. And there is a sort of you know major crackdown on environmental defenders there by the military. So we you've got this sort of a nexus <clears throat> between you know the military action. Uh, red tagging environmental defenders, calling them, uh, you know, communists, etc. You know, and this is going way beyond the mandate of this military. And so, I, in in my report that I made at the end of my visit to the Philippines, you know, called for the abandonment of this anti-insurgency task force called the National Task Force to eliminate communism. So that you know, these these are the challenges that we have. Is that Military are also playing, uh, you know, a role in suppressing public viewpoints uh, in various parts of the world. The other issue of, 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 you know, concern is that we're now seeing climate change cops, you know, the conference of parties uh, being hijacked by the fossil fuel industry itself. And, and this is, you know, clearly a serious concern. I, I was at the climate change COP in, in Dubai in December, you know, and there were serious concerns about, uh, you know, the role of the presidency of the COP, you know, th that uh, had, you know, strong influence over over the outcomes. One, one of the things that's not, not sort of well known, I guess, is not only are there actions, you know, by fossil fuel industries, but there are also mitigation technologies 
you know, to try and reduce emissions that are also having human rights implications and also causing, uh, you know, uh, conflicts. And and I've met with indigenous peoples from from the Amazon who are concerned about the development of hydroelectric dams on their on their country, uh, you know, affecting water courses, uh, their access to food. Uh, and so there are major concerns as a consequence of these so-called, you know, green technologies. Um, you know, we we one of the issues is around uh, electricity supply and electric vehicles. And you know, there's a major boom in in uh, you know getting uh, sourcing some of these strategic minerals like lithium uh, and so forth. And we see these strong PR messages coming out of companies, the UK based company Glencore putting a sort of, uh, you know, a, a, a clean image on their work. But in reality, there, there are serious human rights issues. Uh, you know, five tech companies have been sued over use of child labor in Congolese cobalt mines. And so the, these are some of the, you know, additional challenges leading to insecurity in some of these countries. And that, that challenge went to a US court, but the US DC court dismissed the cobalt mining case against the five major technic companies. Obviously, you know, there's a huge uh, legal imbalance in representation in these sorts of cases. And the judge found that the people, <coughs> excuse me, taking this case didn't have proper standing to be here, to appear before the courts. So there, there are legal issues of trying to deal with some of these issues. So, you know, the challenge being is what, what can we do about some of these issues? And there are, I guess, you know, a number of approaches that can deal about this. The one I'm particularly interested in is, you know, the corporate accountability. And I've <clears throat> been looking and researching into this issue of, you know, due diligence and disclosure procedures, you know, companies disclosing where they're investing in fossil fuels, uh, wh wh the major financial institutions, the the banks, the uh, <coughs> insurance industry, superannuation funds, you know, should they be disclosing where they're investing their money? And there's certainly work going ahead on this sort of economic, uh, environmental and social governance reporting procedures. European Union is doing work on that and, and the US is doing some work on that. And the, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, you know, has guidelines for business and it, it, I think needs to sort of do some more work in connection with climate change issues. So the Security Council looked at this issue in 2011 and also looked at it again in 2021. And uh, this was brought, you know, a, a resolution was brought uh, uh, by Ireland, I think, um, you know, to get a proper discussion on making this link uh, between climate change and security issues. And um, there was no agreement to, to consider that. And so um, f the Security Council failed to adopt a resolution integrating climate related security risks into conflict resolution prevention strategies. Um, there were 12 in favour, two against, India and Russian Federation. <coughs> Excuse me. And China abstained. And because, you know, Russia is um, one of the P5 members, the permanent members, you know, if they vote against, then they have that right of veto. So th this is a challenge and I, I you know, I went to New York last year and, and met with people in the UN about, you know, is the Security Council the best way to deal with these issues? And at the moment, uh, you know, there's a strong preoccupation with other conflicts. So this is a challenge getting them to think about those issues. Um, just in uh, the earlier this month, NATO started talks with civil society on women, peace and security policy issues. And I think this is a, a very productive way forward. Uh, you know, not only because it has a strong gender focus to this, and I think uh, that sort of, uh, you know, lens of gender considerations 
in conflicts need to be brought out and uh, and a different perspective um, brought forward into this security debate. Uh, you know, obviously there are issues around NATO at the moment, but nevertheless, I think having that sort of discussion is very useful, particularly with a gender focus on them. What, one of the issues that I've been pushing for is, is to give legal protection to people displaced across international borders as a consequence of uh, climate change. And uh, I have suggested to the Human Rights Council uh, that maybe we need a UN General Assembly resolution to commence work on an optional protocol under the Refugee Convention to give legal protection to people displaced across international borders. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily resolve a lot of issues, but it gives some level of security to those people and may relieve some of the, the human rights violations and some of the tensions around those issues if greater work was done around that. You know, I, I don't have any illusions about this being a very sensitive issue. Uh, you know, uh, migration, as you know, uh, in, in Europe is a very sensitive issue, but we can't deny the fact that climate change is driving displacement and migration, and we need to think about giving protection to those people. I also, you know, think we need to develop some sort of grievance mechanism for for particularly people who have suffered abuse uh, you know, and environmental harm as a consequence of standing up for their rights. Uh, you know, and I was suggesting to the UN General Assembly that we establish an international tribunal to indict perpetrators of human rights abuses against environmental and human rights defenders. And this is a, this is a global problem. We're seeing this across the world. Uh, national governments you know, can't do this on their own and we need some sort of international tribunal to deal with that. <clears throat> and finally, uh, you know, the, the UN Secretary General is holding a major summit this year called the Summit of the, uh, of the Future. This is a review of the Sustainable Development Goals and looking at forward thinking approaches to dealing with some of the global problems uh, uh, this, this year. And, and there are, you know, starting to be sort of committee meetings and discussions around what that will do. So there, there are some possible options this year to try and bring into the debate around these security issues. Obviously, there are, you know, a serious uh, turmoil within the world at the moment, and, and maybe people are not so interested in looking at the connection between climate change and security issues, but it's not something that's going to go away. <clears throat> and we need to think, you know, uh, in a, uh, you know, have long term strategies for dealing with these issues, particularly for our younger generation and the next generation as well. So that's that's a sort of, you know, very quick overview of the sort of <clears throat> some of the linkages between climate change and peace and security issues. And I'd more than happy to uh, uh, take questions on that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian, for this extremely rich, thought-provoking, and I would say also very uh, nuanced and uh, comprehensive presentation, because the way you presented the links, the nexus uh, between climate change, our conflicts, human rights violations, dealing with the issue of forced displacement, definitely um, made us uh, realize that the whole issue is way more multi-layered than we think. And uh, it's very true that you mentioned, you know, the 2011 uh, Security Council resolution about climate change as a threat to international peace and security. But we have seen, you know, how climate change is a driver, I wrote down while you were presenting, of different security issues. So you, you highlighted so many things that we could talk forever, but from, from child <laughs> No, to human rights violations of, my, of, of people who are forcibly displaced, to maritime security and piracy. Um, there are so many, many issues that I have. I have my notes here, but I don't want to hijack the discussion. Um, 
However, something that I would like to say is that I remember one of my legal colleagues said once, uh, he made a recommendation to us. He said, don't use the word crisis for everything. You know, we are in crisis, in crisis. Don't trivialize the word crisis. He said, keep the word crisis for the real issue. And the real issue is the climate crisis. Put that in the core of our discourse and, uh, and how we think about the future and future developments. And uh, also, not only you presented um, the main uh, issues and the nuances and so many things that they are touched upon, uh, but also you gave us at uh, the second part of your presentation some ideas of um, how can we deal, what can we, what can be done from from legal accountability to a more um, soft law accountability of business and human rights to tribunals. Uh, I found particularly interesting, you know, that um, in 2020. 21, we couldn't have this resolution uh, in the Security Council. Um, uh, but also, you know, other issues about the special tribunal um, or how NATO deals or the link with gender and human rights. So I stop here. I would like to give the floor first to our audience. And uh, you can put your questions on Q&A. You can use the chat. We can activate the chat or you can raise your hand, you know, and then Liz can give you access. Uh, who would like to take the floor and uh, comment and ask something to uh, Dr. Ian Fry? You have all the floor. I don't know if anyone would like to take uh, uh, from the q and A. I don't see that we have something here, but uh, maybe on the chat. Can you all hear me well? That's the first question. But also you can raise your hand you know, and take the floor. Well, why are we waiting for people to think about this? So it's interesting to sort of understand uh, you know, the two countries who voted against that 2021 resolution, you know, Russia and India. And it, it's interesting to understand what India said. Uh, you know, I looked at the speech by the, uh, the, the representative from India and they said, you know, we take climate change very seriously, but we don't think it's the right forum for dealing with climate change issues. It should be done by the climate change COP. Uh -huh. Of course, uh, you know, there are reasons why they say that because, you know, the developing countries have much bigger numbers uh, in the COP than they do in the Security Council and, and you know, <coughs> therefore can have a better say in, in the outcomes. <coughs> but the COP is not, you know, doesn't have the same level of significance as the Security Council. And, <coughs> and I, I suspect the COP would be very reluctant to talk about security issues. I can imagine. Um, also, you know, if until we give the space, you know, to people to interact more, I have a question uh, regarding the role of human rights and the role of human rights mechanisms that we are. You, you have been a special rapporteur via the special procedures of the Human Rights Council, but but in particular, what we see is also how um, the Human Rights Committee uh, deal with with climate change in two cases they had one of them was to value as well you know uh, and about actually the right to life and how that could be linked to the um uh, to the right to apply for asylum uh, due to to climate change so i was thinking what are your take what is your take about the role of human rights law to complement if any, um, um, uh, climate uh, to complement issues and challenges, human rights violations deriving from uh, climate change. Yes, <clears throat> well, it was, yeah, the two interesting cases, the Billy case, which was uh, uh, brought by Torres Strait Islanders off Australia <clears throat> who live in very low lying situations and, and they took that to the human rights committee and the committee found in their favour and said Australia wasn't doing enough to, to protect the people. The, the committee didn't say much about, you know, Australia's obligations to reduce its emissions, but basically said it wasn't doing enough to protect those people from the impacts of climate change. <clears throat> and then you had the Tatiota case, which was uh, the, the, the case brought by two Ikiribas couple who were to be deported back to Kiribati and they claimed to be climate change refugees and said that they would, <coughs> you know, suffer as a consequence if they were sent back to Kiribati. <coughs> the, the, the domestic 
courts in New Zealand said they didn't have a case, and so they took it to the Human Rights Committee, and the Human Rights Committee said the same thing, basically, that, <clears throat> that there wasn't enough evidence to say that their, their lives would be threatened as a consequence if they were de being deported. Nevertheless, they did say and uh, that, you know, decision makers need to be aware of climate change as a decision in making administrative decisions about uh, migration issues. So there's some useful precedent there, even though those people were not successful in, in being defined as so-called climate change refugees. Thank you very much, Sian, for that, because it gives a little bit, uh, uh, it gives us this nuanced uh, picture regarding, you know, uh, legal imagination, as I say, and how you can use such as a general comment on the right to life and how you can link it uh, on that. Uh, again, I, I encourage people uh, to, to, to ask questions, but I have one more question for you before I, I give the floor to others. And that is about this new movement we have of intergenerational justice litigation. And we see that before domestic courts, but also before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, we have a massive, I would say, a proliferation of legal um, climate litigation, also with the advisory opinions that we have from to the Inter-American Court, but also before the ICJ. And I was wondering, you know, how do you see uh, all these uh, uh, legal developments come together and uh, how do you see they can contribute uh, towards further um, protection? Well, it's, yes, this is very interesting. And I, I, I looked at that issue as part of my last report to the UN General Assembly. So there's some interesting developments. The, the Portuguese children case in the European Commission of uh, Court of Human Rights is a very interesting case because it, it does talk about the rights of present and future generations. And I, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, you know, there have been some court cases in the United States, some of them thrown out. Um, but some ha have made progress. I think the one in um, Minnesota, I think, was quite useful in, in that regards, you know, <clears throat> highlighting this fact. And the advisory opinion uh, of the International Court of Justice will be an interesting one. I've just worked on an amicus brief for that case, particularly around the issue of intergenerational justice. <clears throat> and as you, saw, as you rightly point out, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has also been looking at looking at an advisory opinion brought by Chile and Colombia around those issues. My sense is, you know, the uh, the the real direction I think we're heading is that we've previously <clears throat> a lot of cases have been brought against governments, and we saw that with the Ugenda case in the Netherlands. <clears throat> but we're now starting to see cases brought against board directors and the Greenpeace. Uh, did that, and I, I think this is a critical area. While that was thrown out by the court, I, the, they're challenging that, you know, uh, that decision. <coughs> it was against Shell, and I, I think this is where the, you know, w you know, courts will start to ha have a significant influence if they start <coughs> naming individuals of corporations uh, and making them liable for their decisions. Uh, so I think that's an interesting direction I think we're heading in. Again, thank you very much for this observation. Liz, you have the floor. Hey. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello. Um, thank you, firstly, for a very interesting and um, very broad and wide reaching. I'm impressed by the kind of number of cases and incidents and stuff that you managed to pack into a, a half hour presentation. Um, my question is in some ways very simple and in some ways probably difficult to answer, but I decided it's not every day that you get the opportunity to ask a former UN Special Rapporteur a question. Um, so looking, as Maria said, to, you know, what we can do moving forward, I'd be very interested to know from your kind of experiences visiting so many places that are affected by climate change and human rights issues, which one peaks the most concern um which which do you see as you know the most kind of critical issue that as an international community really if we don't focus on it quite immediately and in a very sustained manner then you know there are quite significant issues that are going to arise uh shortly 
Yeah, <laughs> it's a challenging question, obviously, because there are so many fronts that we have to fight on on this issue. Clearly, you know, we we need to take urgent action to reduce emissions globally, and so that that's the cru crucial area. And so, how do, how do we force that agenda? And we, we're certainly, you know, the the climate change cops aren't forcing that agenda. You know, we've had debates, you know, going back to the Glasgow COP about you know phasing down and or phasing out fossil fuels. And, you know, we seem to have a succession of countries that, that are fossil fuel exporters hosting COPs, and that's not going to change in the near future. <clears throat> but I, I think, you know, the, the area of litigation is critical to, to drive, uh, you know, greater action to reduce emissions. I think that that's a critical issue. But we can't, you know, the whole issue of loss and damage is critical. That, that we, you know, people are already suffering. Even if we stopped emissions today, there'd be still a lot of people suffering. So we have to find remedies to deal with those people and provide reparations and compensation for those people. Thank you very much, Ian. I have two questions on the chat. Uh, you can take the floor, but I can read the questions from the audience. Uh, so Mariam uh, says, um, ask, we see how she says how, we see how climate change has disproportionately impacted already uh, economically vulnerable countries. For example, you know, after the recent floods, Pakistan claimed for international support, arguing that they suffered disproportionately for something that was exacerbated by developments and acts in the West. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that first? And what initiatives do you think could these regions take to mitigate some of those climate change impacts? And then we have another question as well. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, the, the problem being is that climate change is a global problem. And, and so... You know, a lot of the emissions, you know, the majority of emissions are coming from, uh, you know, the big emitting countries, and that's now China, United States, India, uh, Japan, and the European Union, I guess the five biggest emitters. So the, the, they've got a, a greater responsibility. And unfortunately, it's the poorer countries that have to to deal with those issues and, and you know, dis suffering disproportionate impacts. I, I I did go to Pakistan last year as well and and uh, appeared at a, a security conference in Pakistan and they clearly see this as a security issue because of the huge uh, you know floods that they suffered in 2022. So, so you know there needs gr much greater support mechanisms for these countries, but um, but also you know the big emitters have to take much greater action and and take greater responsibility for their for their emissions. Thank you, Ans Morian. And then we have a, another question related also to transitional justice from uh, Hilai. He says, given the increased link between climate change and conflict, it would be really helpful to hear your thoughts about how climate change related factors could be incorporated into the transitional justice process going forward to peace and more resilient uh, peace. Is there a role for education in this context which could incorporate climate change issues? Well, you know, obviously the answer is yes. You know, we people have to be aware of, of the impacts of climate change. The, the, the challenge is, is that, you know, there's a lot of climate change denialism. And, and as we're seeing in the lead up to the US, next US election, you know, one of the major candidates is, is a climate change denier. And, and so this, this represents challenge uh, that, you know, there are challenges with the media as well. You know, the major media outlets are, are cl climate change denial. So that there has to be some way of dealing with that as well. So certainly, you know, greater education about the seriousness of climate change is needed to to counteract, you know, the 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 you know the media outlets that are that are major climate change denialists. Thank you again, and uh, we have also one more um, uh, question from Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn asks, um, she says, I'm an organization studies early career scholar, and I'm interested in the practices surrounding the organizing of hope, care, and justice. So my question is, how can we continue this conversation, especially when COP is co-opted activists who disrupt the flow of commerce, especially when COP 
um, it, sorry, is co-opted. Uh, activists who disrupt the flow of comments are demonized. <coughs> well, you know, there's there's a, a variety of approaches that people can take on these issues. I think, and <coughs> and certainly, you know, getting active in in various uh, organisations is critical. <coughs> you know, I, I you know do a lot of work with Human Rights Watch, uh, Oxfam. These are all very active in the in this space, and I encourage people, you know, to to volunteer to support them for for their work. The Environmental Justice Foundation um, held an alternative COP, and so this was an online COP that they held, you know, for people most affected by climate change, uh, uh, as as an alternative to these sort of high, heavily biased COPs. But we, we have to make inroads into these dialogues. And so, you know, at the moment, the World Economic Forum is being held, uh, you know, and this is big business. This is big, uh, you know, po politics. And so we have to find inroads into that that sort of conversation. And, and you know, uh, Greta Thunberg has been, you know, making statements about the World Economic Forum and we need to, you know, provide support for her uh, you know, for those those sorts of commentaries to to you know ha have an alternative voice in in this area and space. Yes, uh, I think we have ten more minutes. So if I can, uh, 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 more people can join us. But I have a question, if that's okay with you, Ian. I was particularly intrigued about um, when you mentioned that you proposed an optional protocol to the refugee protection in order to incorporate a clear um, definition of the climate uh, refugee. And we saw these discussions took place during the, um, the global compacts as well. Uh, we had two global compacts at the end of the day. Uh, of course, we don't have a separate um, definition. There is some acknowledging on climate change as driver of displacement, but my understanding is that the world is kind of um, it's not that strong over there. There is an acknowledgement. I think in the on the global compact on migration is much stronger than refugees. So, and there are some people that say actually that we already have a system. We have a, a, a system of human rights protection, so we don't need uh, a separate legal protection. I would like a little bit to ask you further more about this proposal. Why do you think um, uh, that an optional protocol, you know, would be uh, would uh, have an added value, you know, if we had that. And um, also I found particularly interesting your suggestion to the General Assembly for, 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 for a tribunal. So if you would like to talk a little bit more about these two proposals. <coughs> yes, thank you. I, I When I was working for the Tuvalu government, I was involved in some of the negotiations around the global compact on migration. And we had a real battle getting climate change mentioned in that, in the, in the early drafts of that so that you know there was pushback around that issue of course you know the these two compacts on migration and and uh, refugees are soft law there are no legally binding requirements so that that's a challenge around those issues <clears throat> and you know I, I while there are there is human rights law in a very general sense it doesn't necessarily give you know specific protection to people displaced across international borders. And and uh, so, you know, I, I, I think something more formal, uh, you know, under the, the Refugee Convention would give a trigger for the High Commission for Refugees to take action. And they seem to be the most logical approach to deal with that. You know, I, I did look at other options, you know, and it, it's a challenge. There are other very, you know, soft law you know, approaches. There was the Nansen Initiative, which is now the German government's taken up a, 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 a platform for, I, I can't remember the, the name, but it's, a, uh, you know, it's another soft law approach to dealing with that issue. But, uh, you know, I, I thought that we needed more legal approaches. And there's certainly been some regional work, you know, the, there's the uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has, has worked on uh, expanding the definition of refugees and and, and the uh, African Union has also done that to to incorporate uh, people who have uh, suffered from public disorder. I'm not sure that climate change fits that definition, but it's, it shows a willingness to change the definition. 
But it, it became very clear to me that it would not be worthwhile amending the Refugee Convention because, you know, it has a, a strong history and it, it, it might, you know, uh, I, I think it would be difficult to amend it. So I thought, you know, optional protocol that doesn't interfere with the current Refugee Convention might be the way forward. Of course, I don't have any illusions that it's going to happen very quickly, you know, considering the sensitivity of migration debates these days. But I, th I think, you know, to give proper protection to people, uh, we need to make that formal step. Thank you. We have two more questions. Um, maybe the I will change the order. <laughs> maybe we can finish with Claire's question. But Marian before asks uh, that uh, you mentioned before that reducing emissions should be a priority, uh, particularly when it comes from the big emitters. But when we see barely, but we see barely any effort in reducing fossil fuel emissions subsidies announcements of other explorations, North Sea, for example, something that you mentioned before with the UK uh, stand, and companies buying influence within the government. So the outlook <laughs> looks rather grim. And I think Claire's uh, uh, question is kind of linked to that because it says, how do you prevent becoming overwhelmed by the enormity of these issues? So we have a dire reality or a grim prospect on the other hand you know and we are all overwhelmed you mentioned you know that the international agenda has been um i won't say hijacked but it has been dealt with some very issue very tough issues the last year so what is your personal standing what is your hope what is your um, advice for that you know well you know i i i you ha have have to think about where the weak links in this whole sort of economic system, I guess, and 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 the opportunities. And certainly, the renewable energy industry has, you know, is is growing quite rapidly, and and we have to promote the renewable energy industry in in whatever way possible. Possible, and and you know, as I was saying, you know, look at this corporate accountability, and there, there's certainly steps around that. You know, uh, you know, to 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 bring, you know, out into the public arena, uh, you know, the accountability of corporations, where they're putting their money, et cetera. And that's a critical issue. I, I There's one other issue that I haven't mentioned, and this is what's called the Energy Charter Treaty, which is, a, you know, a, a, another, another serious concern is that it basically locks in energy contracts. And so, uh, and so we're, what we're seeing is, that uh, fossil fuel companies are suing countries for taking action on climate change. And we saw that with Italy, uh, you know, millions of dollars uh, that they were, uh, you know, taken before a tribunal under the Energy Charter Treaty, even though they had withdrawn from the Energy Charter Treaty, they were still found liable. Uh, and so the European Union is trying to encourage countries to step out of the out of the Energy Charter Treaty, but it's still around. You know, uh, Mozambique was brought before a tribunal and had to pay millions of dollars in compensation for trying to move away from fossil fuels. And th th this is a huge injustice. And, and so that's another area that we have to chip away at is to, to get rid of this Energy Charter Treaty or to redirect it towards, you know, only providing guarantees for renewable energies. Wow, it seems if you if you have five more minutes, if it's OK with you, it seems now that we have a flood of questions, you know, but, um, yes. but I, I think Lucas uh, question is very relevant. Actually, it's something that you touched upon about Philippines and the crackdown. So he says the strong link between climate change and conflicts could lead to a more significant role for the military. That's what you mentioned as well. However, this may result in an ambiguous situation where the military is used to help people after disasters, but also before against activities. Something you mentioned the crackdown on case, you know, environmentally activists named as communists, you know, in in, in Philippines. We in Philippines has also a very particular record, uh, bad record, direct record when it comes to drug trafficking as well. And uh, so, what actions can be taken to address these aspects and maybe I will have one more question and then we can we can let you <laughs> it's yeah, too late I mean, it's late yeah, in the Philippines is very sad you know I, I met with some indigenous women in a secret location and they they had some very 
sad stories to tell about the fact that this military came in, uh, pulled them out of their houses and shot their husbands in their houses at night because they had protests, protested against a dam on their land, you know, uh, de defined tribal lands under Philippines law, uh, they were being persecuted and, and the army was being used to do that. And I, I heard others, uh, you know, two young women, 21 years old, uh, had protested against land reclamation projects in Manila Bay. They were abducted by the military uh, and kept hostage for over 11 days, you know, and subjected to various forms of psychological torture. Uh, and, uh, you know, I met with these people and uh, young people and, you know, they're very brave and w we have to call this out. You know, we we just have to draw attention to these, you know, and so organisations like Human Rights Watch and that are doing that. And, I, you know, I really admire the work that they're doing in those sorts of areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sian. If I can wrap up this wonderful discussion, I'm sure, you know, because you touch upon so many issues. And uh, for example, when you mentioned about NATO and gender, of course, gender and climate change, or you, you refer to indigenous populations. And we know the particular, like if we think about Brazil, about other places, you know, the role of indigenous population when it comes to cl climate protection. Uh, so I think we can do another <laughs> a series of webinars with you to to just to focus on particular themes. But if you, I will try to wrap up this very brief discussion. Wonderful, by the way. And um, I found very interesting. Uh, you come back to corporate accountability, you know, and and you say that the the it was um, can I say shifting point, you know, when we have litigation against corporate corporations, you know. Because we have litigation towards states, we talk about the intergenerational uh, justice litigation, but you say, you know, this is a key issue and, and you come back to that. I think you mentioned that two or three times. So I was wondering, you know, if we bring that in complementarity, as we say, you know, with the, with the Secretary General's vision for the uh, summit of the future, okay, which is, as we say, reassessment of the um, uh, sustainable development goals, plus what type of future do we want? Um, how do you think these pieces could come together? Uh, do you think that maybe, you know, the Security Council, could we have a different standing before the security? How do you see the summit of the future as a whole approach, basically? And maybe this is where I can I can stop and maybe this is how we can conclude this wonderful discussion. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, you know, but considering global politics at the moment, you know, there was a review of the Sustainable Development Goals last year and it didn't result in a lot of outcomes i i hope and i th i think the the un secretary general was trying to uh you know delay the summit of the future it was to be last year but i think he was trying to delay that to separate it out from the review of the sdgs and and you know have something uh you know to properly consider I understand there are already some, you know, processes for developing draft outcome documents now. So, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to sort of look at that yet, but hopefully, you know, there'll be something meaningful coming out of that process. So, uh, oops. so on that note, that hopefully something meaningful will come out of that process. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for this wonderful uh, discussion and contribution. I'm telling you, it was so rich that we can talk. Um, we should do something more about, uh, especially gender indigenous. I find it particularly intriguing, and. Um, I think, you know, uh, responding to the questions of the audience, we don't leave them with a doom feeling, you know. Yes, the situation is dire, uh, but also on the other hand, we have seen that there is so much, there is a variety of action uh, from different actors, whether it's at the international level, domestic, regional level, non-state actors, states, international organizations. So hopefully, as you say, something meaningful will come out. Of that. So thank you very much, Sian. It was wonderful talking to you. And I see someone raising her hand. Uh, no, no. 
it was a mistake. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person uh, in London whenever you come to this part of the world, you know. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I'm more than happy to have further dialogues uh, around some of these issues. It's, uh, it's been a yeah, good discussion and I, I enjoy having these sorts of discussions. It, it challenges me to think about these issues, so I'm more than happy. And hopefully I'll have an opportunity to be uh, visit you in person. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And uh, good night from London to Canberra. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye all. See you soon for our next webinar. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, Liz, very much. I want to thank Liz once more, our PhD researcher and uh, accommodator of all these events. Elizabeth Brown, you have great. Thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.